Welcome to our class. We're so pleased that you've come. Uh, we're working our way through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Dr. Femi Perkins is our leader this this uh, book. She teaches uh, New Testament studies. Mark is sort of her specialty at uh, Boston College, Roman Catholic Seminary. Uh, try to get scholars from different uh, Christian persuasions. Always, of course, people who are acknowledged to be really good scholars, and we're counting on her to help us um, move our way through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, these professors who spend 40 years of an adult lifetime uh, finally produce a major work. Uh, they give you far more information than you probably want. And if we spent all our time reading everything that someone like Dr. Framey Perkins has written about her gospel, we'd never get through. So what I do is go through and, and read and highlight in yellow the things that I think represent her best argument as to why we should interpret something a certain way, and that's the part that I share with you. Let's pray as we begin. God, we thank you for this all-important book of yours. We know that the way we look at this book has much to do with where we worship on a Sunday morning and how we conduct our lives. We trust that we, United Methodists, understand this book to be yours while still believing that you work through very real people. There was no magic, no superstition, no great mystery as to how this book came into being. That you were able to find people of faith who would tell your story you did not give them knowledge of all disciplines. They were limited by their own time and place in many ways, and yet were able to discern things that are forever true about you and about us, how you initiate relationship with us and how we may respond and so be rightly related to you. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, we have two healing stories. We're in Mark chapter 5, beginning with verse 21. So we're going to read a fairly long portion here. hope you'll follow along. If your eyes are seeing what your ears are hearing, uh, you comprehend all the better. Any good educator will tell you that. So I hope you'll look at the words as I read along with you and for you, and then we'll see what Dr. Perkins believes is most important about these two healing stories. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd followed around him, and he was by the sea. Now, just a quick remember, uh, remembering where we've been. Jesus has just come from across the lake, and it, when it says sea, they don't mean the Mediterranean, they mean this, the Sea of Galilee, which is a freshwater lake. Uh, <clears throat> he grew up at a little town called Nazareth, which is about... 15 miles off this lake, just a little bit north and west. Uh, this lake is not huge. Uh, it's about 12 miles at its longest point. It's about 8 miles across. Um, particularly at night, you can see lights on one side from the other. Most tourists stay at Tiberias, which is a sister city to Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, Tiberias is here, about where the nine would be. Jesus had moved his base of operations, if you would, from his hometown at Nazareth over to Capernaum, the hometown of Peter and Andrew, James and John. There's another little town right nearby. Um, neither of these is a functioning town today. Bethsaida was also right close by there. Um, there were ten of them, we, we are told, around this portion of the lake. So they're called the Decapolis, ten towns. Uh, over time, they all have disappeared. There's another settlement right down here where the, where the lake empties into the Jordan River and it continues southward. Jesus has been across into what was Gentile territory, uh, and we read about that. Now he's crossed back over the sea, if you would, and he is beside the sea. That's what Mark tells us then. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, and again, I hope uh, one of these days we will feel it's safe enough to travel again in Israel. I hope for all of you a trip to Capernaum uh, to see what they have unearthed there as a part of this synagogue that is talked about right here. 
Then one of the leaders of the synagogue, named Jairus, came and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him. Remember, power in the New Testament, the Greek word is dunamis, from which we get words like dynamite, dynamic, dynamo, and so on. Um, the verb form of, of this word is to be able. Translated, to be able. And if you are able, then you have power. If you have power, then you are able. Here is the noun. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? His disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, remember in the last uh, passage we were dealing with, his own family had come to check up on him. People were saying he was out of his mind. They came perhaps to take him home to Nazareth. And when he was told, Your mother and your brothers are outside, he said, Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Those who do the will of my father. Those who are here with me. That's the point. And so here he calls this woman daughter. Though there is no physical relationship at all, of course. Uh, but she is family. She is a believer. And that's what Mark wants us to understand. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in shalom and be healed of your disease. And while he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. You know that people around the Mediterranean tend to be pretty emotional. Uh, you see this on your television. Uh, women of the Middle East often uh, trill their tongue and vibrate the little uvula in the roof of their mouth when they're very happy or when they're really upset. It's la 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 la. If you watch television, you can see it. Jews can do it. Arabs do it a lot. Okay. <clears throat> when he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him, meaning those three disciples, Peter, James, and John, and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum. He spoke Aramaic, remember, which means, and here Mark knows that his readers don't know Aramaic. That's why he explains to them. The words he said in Aramaic were Talitha kum, but I know you don't know what that means, so I'm telling you it means, little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about. She was 12 years of age. At this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Okay, let's see what Dr. Perkins thinks is most important about these two stories. Mark combines the story of a woman who's been hemorrhaging for 12 years with the cure of Jairus' daughter by having the former occur while Jesus is on the way to Jairus' house. In contrast to the esteemed synagogue official, the woman remains a nameless member of the crowd. We never know her name. The length of her affliction and the fact that she has been impoverished by spending all of her resources on doctors who've only made her condition worse underline the crisis of her situation. Her flow of blood 
poses the danger of ritual impurity for anyone who comes into contact with her. They didn't understand nearly as much about blood as we do, but blood was something that could give you trouble, and if all your blood ran out, they knew you died. The woman concludes on the basis of Jesus' reputation. She decides that merely touching his clothes will be sufficient to heal her. Acts chapter 5. Remember, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and then wrote the book of Acts. In chapter 5, Luke says that healing power came to those who merely fell in the shadow of Peter and John after the resurrection of Jesus. So her feeling that if she could just touch his clothes, that would be enough. Her instantaneous healing demonstrates that Jesus, in fact, has such power. He is able. The woman's condition has made her ritually impure. Therefore, she must overcome social and ritual boundaries to dare to approach him, certainly to touch him. She has made him ritually unclean. And for a woman to do that to a man was no, no for sure in her world. Jesus immediately recognizes the healing power that's passed from him to someone else. The significance of the miracle requires a confrontation between Jesus and the woman. In that exchange, her faith will be identified as the real source of her healing. Jesus was not concerned about the problems of ritual contamination. We know that. He's already touched a leper in this gospel back in the first chapter. And the woman is said to be familiar with his reputation. Therefore, ritual impurity does not appear to be the primary focus of Mark's narrative. Mark doesn't care about that either. Healing reflects the presence of God's saving power. And Jesus' saving and healing presence demonstrates what we've already been told. The kingdom of God is near. The woman's gesture of pushing through the crowd to touch Jesus' garment resembles the faith exhibited by those who brought the paralytic to Jesus and lured him on a pallet. Jesus points to the woman's faith as the real agent of healing and pronounces her cure permanent. <clears throat> she recognizes the extraordinary divine power possessed by Jesus. Fear and trembling are common responses to the presence of the divine. Jesus addresses the woman as daughter, suggesting that she now has a personal relationship to Jesus as one of her own family. It carries more personal overtones than would the term woman which he uses in many other places in the gospel. I mean, it's used by the gospel writers, as Jesus having said even to his own mother. Jairus stands at the opposite end of the socioeconomic scale from this unnamed woman. His status as a ruler of the synagogue marks him out as a wealthy and influential member of his community. He would have been accustomed to having others beg him for favors. One might expect such a person to send an emissary to ask Jesus to come and heal his little girl. The fact that the father comes himself, throws himself at Jesus' feet, begging for help, shows that he is as desperate as the hemorrhaging woman. He too knows Jesus' reputation as a healer and is certain that if Jesus lays his hands on the daughter, she will recover. By interrupting the journey to Jairus' house, with the story of the hemorrhaging woman, Mark creates a time delay in the narrative, providing space for the girl to die, messengers to report to the father, and mourners to gather at the house. Jesus takes the initiative by telling Jairus to have faith. The reference to faith picks up the conclusion to the healing of the woman. By interweaving these two stories, Mark has provided an opportunity for the father to witness that scene. A woman's faith has led to her healing. Jairus' faith can lead to the healing of his daughter. When Jesus and those with him arrive at the house, the mourners laugh at his claim that the girl is not dead. Funeral rites have already begun. Unlike the earlier miracles, which were performed in public, Jesus limits the audience for this one. The three disciples who accompany him, Peter, James, and John, will serve as an inner group at the Transfiguration with Moses and Elijah and in Gethsemane on the night he's betrayed and then arrested. 
this limitation of witnesses echoes two Old Testament scenes. And notice what she's about to tell you here. That Mark is aware of similar things having occurred in the Hebrew Scriptures in their long ago history. One is Elijah's taking the widow's son apart to his own chamber when he restores the boy's life. That's in 1 Kings 17. And Elisha and his servants going into the room alone to restore life to a Shunammite woman's son, 2 Kings chapter 4. Although in the Old Testament examples, the mother is excluded, here Jesus includes both parents. Jesus does not engage in extended prayer and physical gestures toward the body before life is restored. He simply takes the girl's hand. Jesus immediately restores her to life, just as the woman has been immediately cured when she had touched Jesus' garment in the street. The girl shows that she's been healed by getting up and walking around. The astonished reaction of witnesses indicates that a miracle has in fact taken place. Yet Jesus apparently provides another proof of the cure when he commands those in the room, feed her. Mark attaches a command to silence to the conclusion of this miracle. The command makes no sense to us. Jesus has expelled a crowd of mourners from the house. Friends and associates have been involved with the family from the beginning. Clearly, the girl's cure will not remain a secret. The miracle itself provokes the question of Jesus' identity and some awe over the power he exercises. Jairus' request expresses confidence that if Jesus touched the girl, she would get well, which is a rendering of a verb that means be saved as well. The woman with hemorrhaging was assured that her faith had made her well or saved her. Use of the verb save in a context that anticipates a miracle is a prominent feature in the story of Jesus' crucifixion, as Mark tells it. This same verb is used when Jesus is challenged to save himself. If you can save the woman in the street, if you can save Jairus' daughter, why don't you save yourself? Same verb. Scribes and Pharisees comment later in the Gospel, chapter 15, that although Jesus could save others, he cannot save himself. They challenge him to come down so that they can see and believe. The woman and Jairus came to Jesus with the faith appropriate to all disciples, to all who would learn of him. Okay, just a few more sentences here. The story of a nameless woman who has exhausted her resources seeking medical treatment for a chronic condition is what this is about. The strong affirmation he gives to her faith at the end of the story alleviates the apparent harshness in the search for the woman. Jesus does not personally take credit for making her well, but points to her faith as the real source of healing. Now, every parent who's ever had a seriously ill child can identify with Jairus. Parents find it more painful to entrust a young child to the hospital, knowing that the youngster is about to undergo a risky or lengthy surgical procedure, than to undergo similar treatment on themselves. For every family whose child makes a complete recovery from major surgery or life-threatening illness, there is another family whose child dies. Faith and healing come after the fact as families learn to remember with gratitude the child they have lost. Chapter 6 <clears throat> He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. He said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that's been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. He was amazed at their unbelief. Now you'll notice here a few details about Jesus' family. One, Joseph is not mentioned. Jesus is himself called the carpenter. Leading people to believe, scholars, that Jesus was looking after his mother, 
and younger siblings after the death of his father. That he worked as a carpenter. And this word does not just mean one who deals with wood. There wasn't much wood in that part of the, of the world. It can also mean a stonemason. There are far more rocks. So whether he was a trimmer of stones and more like a brick mason, or whether he actually did a lot of work with wood, we cannot be for sure. The word can mean both. Where did he do this work? It's amazing that a very large, for that day, town lay just a just three short miles from Nazareth. This town is not mentioned in the New Testament. It was a Gentile town. Uh, nothing significant spiritually seemed to have taken place there. And in time, people moved away and it disappeared, if you would. Only in the last few years has it been unearthed. It's called Sepphoris. S-E-P-P-H-O-R-I-S. Sepphoris. Beautiful mosaics, floor mosaics, covered over by blowing dust and dirt and grass, for 2,000 years have been unearthed at Sepphoris. We've seen them ourselves. Um, it is a very interesting place, and those who delve into these kind of things believe that Joseph, while he was alive, and Jesus would almost surely have sought work in Sepphoris. They could have walked every morning, every afternoon. I told you my father worked, walked three miles to work and three miles back in the afternoon when he and my mom first got married. People who walked a lot, who had no cars, of course, and didn't even own an animal in a cart, they walked. And so Sepphoris may have been the place where Jesus applied his trade. He's called, in some places, the carpenter's son. In other places, he's called the carpenter himself. He, a carpenter. Four brothers are named, names given, four brothers. James is listed first, and James will become a very strong leader in the Jerusalem church after the death and resurrection of Jesus. It says sisters, that would be plural, so this is where scholars believe that Jesus was the oldest of at least seven. There may have been more girls, but at least two to be plural. So four younger brothers, at least two younger sisters. Hence, if his father has died after these children were born, he's looking after his mother and these younger children. Maybe the reason why he didn't begin his public ministry until he was about 30. Okay. Well, let's see what Dr. Perkins says here. Jairus and the hemorrhaging woman sought Jesus' help because they had faith in what they'd heard about him. Their faith forms a striking contrast to the reception Jesus receives in his hometown of Nazareth. Jesus astonishes those gathered in the synagogue with his teaching and healing. Readers might expect an example of healing or exorcism to follow here, as in Capernaum, but it doesn't. Will those with familial and social ties to Jesus believe in him? Reading the episode against the backdrop of honor and shame in peasant villages provides some insight into the hostile reception. Jesus has stepped out of the status and role in society that he had in the village. Most scholars believe Nazareth in Jesus' time had about 1,600 people. You can imagine a little town about that size. About 1,600 people. Our only evidence in the New Testament for Jesus' occupation is the term commonly translated carpenter. This word can be used to describe anyone who works in wood, or other hard materials. In that day, people would not have built whole houses out of wood, so as a carpenter, Jesus would have been called upon to produce door frames and other wooden objects, would not build complete dwellings if he dealt strictly with wood. We cannot be for sure. Since Galilee was prosperous during this period, Jesus and his family were not impoverished tenant farmers or day laborers, but his status as a local craftsman would have been considerably lower than that of a member of the educated class. Villagers commonly resent those who attempt to elevate their position above that to which they are entitled by birth. There was a very strict caste system. <clears throat> Any of you ever watch Are You Being Served on OETA on Sunday nights? It seems strange to you and me, I think, that in the salesmanship in this big department store, 
there is such a pecking order. There is a head of the men's department. And if he's busy, then he will ask the one next to him, uh, are you busy? You know, uh, no, I'm not. Are you busy? Are you busy? In the women's department, only the head of the department gets to wear a little ruffle on her blouse. And when the younger one decides to wear a ruffle one day, she's immediately reproved. No, you, you, you don't get to wear a ruffle. Chair of my board of our church in Beaumont, Texas, worked for Mobile Oil. He was offered a big promotion if he were willing to join Mobile International. He was sent to England to be head of Mobile's big refinery not far from London. And as he would write back to us, and as they would get to fly home a couple of times a year, <clears throat> Paul Pepper would tell us about how different life was in England. Very clear delineation. Who was supposed to wear a coat and tie? Who was to wear shirt and tie, but no coat? Persons who were to wear a dress shirt, but no tie. People who were to wear working shirt, not dress shirt, and so on. When I was a boy, it was understood at the little camp where where I live, gas camp, that the boss men could drive the big car. You remember that Ford and Chevrolet, or Ford and General Motors, had different price levels. So if you were the lowest of the low, you were expected to drive Ford or Chevrolet pickup. If you got promoted a little bit, then you could have a Ford or Chevrolet sedan. Or if you wanted to go crash, you could have a Plymouth. If you were a little higher up, then it was okay for you to have a, a Dodge if you bought from Chrysler. Or you could have a Mercury if you bought from Ford. Or you could have a Pontiac if you draw, bought from General Motors and so on. And then the next level up, of course, you got the Continentals and Cadillacs and Imperials and that sort of thing. And people around small towns looked to see if you were driving over your head. You know? One of my uncles, <clears throat> divorced from one of my dad's sisters, had royalty. He had oil and gas. He didn't appear to have any money at all if you drove out past his house. He lived most of his adult life in a trailer house, in the woods. But he got a big check every month from one of the oil companies. And he drove the biggest and finest car the Chrysler made every two years. And he ate all his meals in town. He drove four or five miles into Carthage, he ate at Joe's Cafe, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. He drove his car in and out of town three times a day. He was not doing what he was supposed to do. You're not supposed to live in a trailer house and drive the biggest imperial that they make. But that's what he did. And so it made him a conversation piece with most of the people. But unless you've ever lived in one of those kind of communities, you may not understand what she's talking about here. But if Jesus is a carpenter, then that's one level. But it's not the level of those who had been able to spend their time learning how to read and how to write and so on. We see this in Tevye. If I were a rich man, he says... I wouldn't have to get up so early and milk these cows. I wouldn't have to hitch up my old horse to the cart and deliver milk door to door. If I were a rich man, I could go straight to the synagogue every day and there debate with the elders. Until one day someone would say to me, Reb Tevye, which is short for rabbi. Somebody would call me a teacher but not as long as I'm a milkman. Not as long as I'm milking cows and delivering milk. It isn't going to happen, you see. All right, that's what she's trying to get at here. The attempt by Jesus' family to stop his wandering and public preaching implies that the perspective of the village is that Jesus is dishonoring his family. He's supposed to come home and nail and saw things, if that's what he was doing. You see, those who wrote and composed Jesus Christ Superstar really understood a part of all of that. They understood that if Jesus had done all these miracles in his hometown, 
every restaurant would have been full, filled with eaters, and every inn and hotel would have been filled with people who needed a bed. He would have been like Lourdes today, or some of these other famous places where Jesus is supposed to have visited, or the Virgin Mary appeared, or whatever. Shestakova in Poland. You cannot get buses close enough to the church that you don't have to walk a long way to get in the church of Chestakova because somebody said 500 years ago they saw a painting bleed from a sword pierced of the canvas. And the people came. You see, Jesus Christ could have been that superstar in Nazareth, and he wasn't. And they resented it. What he could have done for them, he didn't do for them. He says it was their hardness of heart. Prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. There they may not get it. Okay. Designating Jesus as son of Mary rather than son of Joseph may have been intended as an insult by the crowd. Where does this man get all this wisdom and power may imply a hostile answer where perhaps he's the offspring of someone other than his father. That was really saying something bad about him if that's what they were saying. The townspeople are scandalized by the human origins of Jesus, whom they know as a carpenter. As Mark's readers would expect, Jesus responds to what people are thinking about him. The proverbial saying, prophets are not without honor except in their hometown, has been expanded with two clauses, among their kin and in their own house. The qualifying clauses narrow the region down to the prophet's household and relatives. If this retort is understood as an insult, then Jesus has responded to his critics in kind. That Jesus is unable to work many miracles in Nazareth is hardly surprising. The next sentence applies the verb rendered to marvel, to be amazed, to Jesus. The same verb designates the response of those in the ten towns to the possessed man's story about Jesus healing him and Pilate's reaction to Jesus' refusal to answer him at his trial, and hence his early demise. The term does not imply either faith or insight. In an ironic twist, Jesus is simply amazed at the lack of faith in his home village. I was notified a month ago <clears throat> by mail that I have been chosen as a distinguished alumnus in my hometown, my high school. And Gail and I will go in three weeks on a Thursday night and Friday. I'll be introduced at a reception and uh, at the football game at homecoming as a distinguished alumnus of my hometown and my high school. And you see, um, when I started the school, first grade, uh, rode a bus 12 years, never had a car uh, when I was, I didn't. My mother and father had a car, but I didn't get to drive it to school. I uh, rode a school bus every morning and home every afternoon for 12 years. And the kids who lived in town wore blue jeans. And we who lived out of town wore striped overalls. It was a distinction. We were country kids. Everybody who rode our bus were country kids. <laughs> The bus was almost full when it stopped at the gas camp where I lived. We were the last stop. No one was picked up by this bus the other five and a half miles into town. This was the last stop for this bus. And everybody on the bus were farming kids. So they were treated like we were, striped overall kids. But what do kids do when somebody's leaning on them? They lean on somebody else. And so when we got on the bus, we were called the plant kids from the gas camp. We were the plant kids. And I felt that. I felt poor. I felt poor. My junior year, uh, we had an unusual bunch of kids who'd played football together for five years. And uh, our junior year, we were co-district champs. We lost one game uh, against Kilgore. And, and so the other team had lost one game. And there was a coin toss, and they won, and they went on in the state playoffs, and we didn't get to play anymore. Our senior year, Carthage was really looking forward to big things from our team. We literally were undefeated. Seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, junior varsity, tenth grade. We had not lost a game in four years. And they were looking forward to big things. The booster club promised all of us that our senior year, 
they would have for us gray, our, our team colors were not crimson and cream, but crimson and gray, a light gray color. And we would have light gray slacks, and we would have crimson sport coats and, and ties to wear to all the games. And so we looked forward to that all year. And then when we got there for the first day of practice, we were told that they had checked with the NCAA or whatever the corresponding group would be that deals with high schools, and that they weren't allowed to do that for us. Uh, my best friend was president of the senior class, and I was president of the student body. And he and I both rode school buses, he from the west side and I from the east side of town. And we tried to figure out what can we say to this community about the way they've misled us. How can we form a little protest here? And so we started contacting guys on the football team and saying, every game day, we're going to wear striped overalls and a white shirt that we could buy, uh, sort of a sweatshirt-looking material, but it had a little zipper in front, and it had a Carthage Bulldog on the corner, on the shoulder, and we would wear one of those with Carthage Bulldogs and striped overalls. And when we went to play Marshall and Kilgore and so on, we would wear striped overalls and a white shirt. And that's what we did. It was a protest. <laughs> the country kids are making this football team what it is. The country kids, the plant kids, we're the ones who are making a difference. So after a hundred years, they finally decided, I'm a distinguished alumnus, and I've been invited to come back and have my day. <laughs> I'm not going to wear striped overalls. I'm <laughs> But it's an idea. <laughs> if I knew the rest of my team would show up in striped overalls, I would. <clears throat> okay, a little bit more on this. The episode in Nazareth forms a somber counterpoint to the astonishing success that has surrounded Jesus in other towns. Mark's readers probably knew that members of Jesus' family eventually came to believe in Jesus. Now, did you understand that? Mark does not write until about 68 to 70. And the scholars are not quite sure. Some believe he's writing just before the destruction of the temple, and others think he's writing within a few months or weeks after the destruction of the temple in 70. My professors believed it was written just before, about the year 68. But if it's written in 68 or 70, it's already been 40 years since Jesus was crucified and raised. And James. At least his oldest brother has been, has been very active. I mean, he's talked about in the book of Acts and so on. Uh, Paul refers to him in his writings. James was a great leader in the church in Jerusalem. So what she's saying is Mark's readers probably knew that the members of Jesus' family eventually came to believe in him. 1 Corinthians 15 reports that the risen Lord, this is Paul's writing, of course, to Corinth, reports that the risen Lord appeared to James. Another brother in the list, Jude, was credited with composing a brief epistle that we have in the New Testament. Many people are surprised by this story. They think that the people who know Jesus best should have been the first to follow him. People who are able to help others solve complicated personal problems are helpless when their own children are in trouble. When some eighth graders were asked why they thought Jesus was rejected, one boy commented, wasn't his father Joseph dead? Well, what was he doing running out on his mother? She might have starved. Mark's list suggests that Mary had plenty of people to care for her, but this point does have merit. The oldest son was expected to take his father's place in the extended family. Remember, Oldest son received twice as much as anybody else. He also was supposed to look after mom and dad. Jesus' behavior must have been a painful puzzle to his own family. You see, he was a real human being. He had spent much of his adult life at a trade working with wood. Some scholars even surmise that he might have spent time working on building the magnificent Gentile cities like Sepphoris that were not far from his village. Jesus did not overwhelm people as though he were a larger-than-life action hero. He was not Superman, not Spider-Man, not any of the others like that. No stories whatsoever of his ever having done anything unusual 
as to running faster than anyone else, jumping higher than anyone else. Those sorts of things didn't do. A real man, a real person. <laughs> okay, let's go on. <coughs> then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. It was a long stick for walking, you know. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals, not to put on two tunics. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. Remember, repenting, the Hebrew understanding, Jesus' understanding, the disciples' understanding, would have been not that you are merely sorry for wrongs committed, but you are eager to be turned and sent in a different direction. Behavior is supposed to change. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. She says, Jesus has chosen the twelve to participate in his ministry, and he now sends them out. Remember that sending out is called apostello. So we have the word apostle. Jesus gives them the power, the dunamis, the dynamo, to undermine the power of evil as they move about their mission. Since their mission is successful, this section demonstrates the disciples were able to carry out the ministry which Jesus had chosen them. The missionary pairs appear to have been characteristic of early Christianity. Jesus initially called pairs of brothers, Peter and Andrew, James and John. Acts refers to Peter and John, to Barnabas and Paul. The dangers of travel in old times make such arrangements very necessary. Other interpreters have suggested that the use of pairs should be associated with the legal requirement for two witnesses to testify in a case. So two people together, not only one could have sort of looked after the back of the other, but if two are telling you something as being absolute truth, one is more likely to believe. A collection of rules to govern the conduct of traveling missionaries forms the central section of this pericope. There's that word again, the little cut around part that we can lift out and deal with. Mark permits a staff and sandals. Mark's instructions permit disciples adequate clothing, but not a second tunic, which would have provided protection from cold desert night air. Rather, they're to trust God to provide lodging every night. They're not permitted to carry money or extra provisions from one place to another. The disciples were to depend on local hospitality. Since they were required to remain in the first house that welcomed them, they were not to move to a household that offered more luxurious accommodations if they should see one. The final instruction provides a response for those who reject the disciples. Shaking dust off one's feet was a gesture of cursing a place. Clearing away even the dust under one's sandals suggests an even more thorough rejection than merely shaking the dust off one's garments or washing one's hands. Now the twelve share in Jesus' authority and his mission. Both the teaching and healing they perform are extensions of Jesus' own ministry. These simple instructions, which reflect the practice of early Christian missionaries, call those engaged in ministry back to the fundamental basis of all preaching, healing, and teaching. And that is, we're supposed to be doing as best we can what Jesus did. The principle that the gospel comes to bring healing, peace, and good news to people means that missionaries must adapt to the culture of those they come to serve. The gesture of shaking dust off one's shoes acknowledges the mysterious elements in human freedom. Even the most sophisticated and culturally sensitive presentation of the gospel can be rejected. Christians are not to waste their resources in such situations. Others are waiting to hear the gospel move on. Dr. Charles Allen used to tell me <clears throat> when I was making evangelism calls at First Methodist Houston, that he knew a life insurance salesman who starved to death working his old prospect list. Don't keep working the old prospect list. Keep working with new and new and new prospects. Okay? That's the important thing, to keep working new prospects. 
Years ago, I heard one of the professors at Perkins School of Theology speak to a group of teachers here at Boston Avenue. We had brought Dr. Richard Murray up here to speak at a teacher appreciation banquet one night, and I still remember that one of the key points of his address was the use of the word entrust, to entrust something. And he said that good educators need to be able to sleep at night. And so you give to this student, or this group of students, the best you got. And you entrust that effort to Almighty God. And at night, you sleep. You see, just educating people doesn't guarantee that they will always do the right thing. He spoke that night about an experience, uh, the prison system in Huntsville, Texas. <clears throat> One of the largest prisons in the state is in Huntsville. And they had gone into uh, trade school experiments there at the prison in Huntsville. And one of the trades that they taught these uh, men that was desperately needed in the state of Texas at that time was welding. Needed a lot of good welders in the state of Texas. But I remember Dr. Murray saying, but if you teach a man to weld, and then you turn him out the gate, he may go work for a pipeline company, and he may cut the hinges off a bank. I mean, you entrust the effort. You give it the best you got. But there's no guarantee that the one who learned will use it for the right purposes, you see. I think that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples. Uh, whenever someone leaves Boston Avenue Church to go somewhere else, I grieve about that. And Gail's really good at saying to me, shake the dust off your feet. Let the door hit them in the bottom on the way out, you know. If, if they cannot hear what we're trying to do here, if they cannot be a part of the kind of ministry that we want to have here. And next Sunday is a good example when we are going to unveil the new statuary here in our park. I can tell you there are Methodist churches in this city uh, who wouldn't put up a statue with a Muslim child on it for the world. And I'm grateful for this many Boston Avenueers who have been willing to go with me down this road for the last 26 years of saying that neither of these two great monotheistic faiths, Judaism or Islam, the best of them are never asking you and me to be one of them. They simply ask that we bring the best of who we are to the table with them. Friday, we had a wonderful luncheon with three more outstanding interfaith workers being honored. And each one of the presenters did a great job, and each one of those honored and now responding did a wonderful job. And Dr. Sandra Rana was being honored from the Islamic community here. And she said, the more I got involved in dialogue with Jews, the more I got involved in trilogue with Jews and Christians, the more I had to rush home to the Quran and read some more. Go to another class. Because I needed to know more about who I was. And they were asking me not to be one of them, but to bring the best of who I was. And so I had to keep asking, who am I? What do I believe? What do I represent? And I want to say to all of you, she said, you have made me be a better Muslim than I ever was before. And Dean Martin Belsky was saying, you've made me be a better Jew than I've ever been before. And Dr. Tabernay was saying that all of his adult life and work in Australia, he had never been involved in interfaith work. He had done a lot of work in trying to bring Christians together to get Christians to come to the same table and the same discussion. But he said, you Tulsans taught me what it's like to sit down at a table with a Jew. And he had asked a woman, member of the Jewish community, to present him Friday. And Sheila did a wonderful job with that. She said, thank you. The last 15 years, I've learned that I had neglected one of the most important things in the world, sitting down with Jews and 
Muslims. We three, the only monotheistic religions on the planet today, and all of us have a kinship to the God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, and so on. <clears throat> so, I hope what Boston Avenue people are hearing is that those who will criticize us, there will be some, some of your neighbors will criticize us and accuse us of watering down our faith. That to go to the table with these people, we have to water down our faith. And I tell you, this is one more instance where they don't know what they're talking about. You don't water down your faith. You become more interested in learning from your authentic revealer. And our authentic revealer of truth about God and about us is Jesus of Nazareth. And all the years that I've, I've now been involved, I've not become less Christian. I have not become less of a believer in Christ Jesus. Not at any point, nor have I been asked to. In fact, Sheila Mudd's one of those who goads us Christians occasionally and says, you're trying too hard to be like me. You're not like me, and I'm uncomfortable when you're not being you. I need you to be you. I will be who I am, and together we can talk, and we can deal with problems and so on. Okay. So, anyway, uh, I'm grateful. <clears throat> I'm grateful for those who, who hear what I hear, uh, or close enough that you can stay with me on the things that we've tried so hard to do, and that we're still dedicated to doing. I had a phone call this week, this past week, that made, made my week. A woman from Muskogee called me. Her husband is a professor at Bacon College. I don't know her. But this is what she was telling me. She grew up the daughter of an Episcopal minister in Kansas City. A preacher's kid who grew up in the Episcopal Church, who loved the Book of Common Prayer. She has lupus. She is ill. She, has to, she is simply not able some days to function well. And she said... I was missing church, and I started tuning in to Channel 8, Sunday morning at 11. And she said, the first couple of Sundays I watched by myself, and I called my husband in and said, look at what's happening at this church. This church is more like the church I grew up in than any church I've seen in Muskogee. And she said, I really didn't know anything about the Methodist Church. And she said, I started reading and reading. And I discovered you came from us. And I said, yes, we did. And when I came to Boston Avenue 26 years ago, I started saying to our musicians and our educators and our membership, we need to reclaim our Anglican roots. That doesn't mean we're going to be Episcopalians. But I believe the Wesleys were on to something when they never left the Anglican Church in England. In this country we did, and I believe in our denomination. But I also believe, she said, when you did communion, it was exactly like we'd done communion. Then she said, there's only one thing. It didn't make everybody kneel, she said, at the pews. And I said, my church in Beaumont had kneelers. We had kneelers in Beaumont, and we had everybody kneel. And one of the first things I did when I got a look at this sanctuary was to measure the distance between the pews, and there was simply no room for people to kneel. Uh, but I said, I love the kneelers myself. Anyway, we had a great conversation, and I was so thrilled that at least an Episcopalian recognized that we at Boston Avenue have not forgotten nor rejected our Anglican roots, as have many of the Methodists in this community. All right. Any questions you have? I've about used up my time now with all of that. Sorry. <clears throat> but uh, I, you know, when, when I get to go to meetings of pastors of other big churches and they talk about the, their, their congregations and some of the problems and tribulations they have, it's, it's one of the wonderful things about having been somewhere as long as I've had the privilege of being with you is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel with each other every week. Um, I hope uh, I've represented myself clearly enough that you know what I really believe, uh, what I believe God has called me to spend my life doing, uh, and that you've, you've been supportive of that. We had a family that joined our church about a year ago, 
and uh, they were new to the Methodist Church. And I didn't realize that a lot of the things that, that I was saying here was, they were just completely new to this family. No one had ever told them that every writer of the Bible believed the earth was flat. No one had ever told them that. No one had ever told them that every writer of the Bible believed that earth was the center of the universe. That the sun went round the earth every 24 hours. No one had ever told them that. No one had ever told them that you could believe that the one who created the heavens and the earth had used an evolutionary process to get much of that work done. That there is hard scientific evidence that God has in fact helped things evolve and change and evolve and change. I heard a bio uh, a chemist say not long ago that if you need any proof of that, just look at the staph infections at hospitals. They're evolving and changing every day. Every day. Things adapt, 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 and as they adapt, they change. And so did we human beings. And that it's okay to bring your brain to Boston Avenue, bring the best education you were able to, to, to have, um, whatever you're reading now and learning now, bring it, bring it. Um, we believe in academic freedom. We want our educators to take us as far as they can in any given area. And when they get us as far as they can go, we're still going to say, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. But help us understand the process by which God did all these things. Thank you for being who you are.